potato, I like potato, you like tomato, I like tomato, potato, potato, tomato, tomato, let's call the whole thing off. Hey, good morning, everyone. Oh. I'm really happy to be here, and uh, back in Canada, this will be the third year in a row I've come here, and I just love coming up here, so uh, this is a great place. It's, not, it's on. <laughs> well, um, yeah, listen, uh, last night we talked about, uh, 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 Craig Evans kicked us off by uh, telling us that the historical evidence strongly suggests that Jesus exists, existed. And then you had Dan Wallace, I guess I should stand over here. Huh? Uh, Dan Wallace got up and talked about the um, manuscript evidence that the text of the New Testament we have today is essentially, it's almost perfect. Not quite perfect, but almost perfect to what the original said. Um, and better than anything else we have attested from antiquity. So I want to look a little more, uh, delve a little more into the Gospels this morning and talk about some research I've been doing for the last six years. And that, has, that concerns differences in the Gospels. Some call, you can call them discrepancies, you can call them contradictions. These exist. Um, Bart Ehrman, who uh, refers to himself as an ha a happy agnostic, uh, he's probably the most skept uh, influential, skeptical New Testament scholar in the, the United States. And um, Ehrman has this little spiel he goes off on when he talks about the Gospels, and he says things like, um, well, let's just confine this to the death and resurrection of Jesus. Um, was uh, Jesus uh, crucified at 9 a.m., like Mark says, or was it at noon, like John says? Well, it depends which Gospel you read. Um, did Jesus carry his cross all the way uh, like John portrays, or did Simon of Cyrene help him like Matthew, Mark, and Luke portray? Uh, was Jesus crucified the day after the Passover meal, as Matthew, Mark, and Luke portray, or was it the day of the Passover meal, as John portrays? It depends which gospel you read. Um, when Jesus is crucified between two thieves, did both of these thieves curse him, as reported in Mark, or did one repent, as reported in Luke? Uh, did the temple veil split from top to bottom prior to Jesus' death, like Luke reports, or was it after Jesus' death, like Matthew and Mark reports? Well, it depends which gospel you read. And then when you come to the resurrection narratives, um, how many women came to the tomb? Were there multiple women or just Mary Magdalene? And how many angels did they see? One, like Matthew and Mark say, or were there two, like Luke and John says? It depends which gospel you read. And where did Jesus first appear to his disciples? Was it Galilee or was it Jerusalem? And how long was he there? Did, uh, was he on earth uh, for a while, like, Luke, or like John uh, talks about, like Matthew uh, talks about, like Mark suggests? Or did Jesus rise from the dead, all the appearances and the ascension on Easter? like Luke portrays. It depends which gospel you read. And by the time Ehrman is through all these differences, just in the passion narratives and resurrection narratives, uh, a lot of times evangelicals or uh, Christians are just there going, say it ain't so. What is this? I mean, you know, how can we trust the gospels when they disagree on so many things? Well, uh, for me, my uh, primary area of expertise has been the historical evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. I'll be talking about that a little bit later this afternoon. Um, and that's what I did the majority of my work on. So, you know, I, I, I studied this as a historian, looked at it. And, you know, I, I thought, if Jesus rose from the dead, Christianity's true, right? Um, I, I think most people would agree. If he rose from the dead, Christianity's true. Well, if uh, they think Jesus was crucified in either 30 or 33, um, it's a toss-up when. So if Jesus rose in 30 or 33, let's just take the round number 30. If he rose in 30, Christianity was true in 30. The first piece of New Testament literature was written maybe about 20 years later, maybe a little bit earlier. Um, so if Jesus rose from the dead, was Christianity true before any of the New Testament literature was written? Well, yeah. So let's say there's some errors in the New Testament literature. If Christianity was true before any of that literature was written, how would some errors, if there were errors or contradictions in the Gospels, how would that negate the truth of Christianity when it was true before they were even written? So um, 
it, it, I think a lot of times evangelical Christians can get mm, maybe just a little bent out of shape and, and uh, over maybe some differences in the Gospels, but they still do. At least they do down where I'm at in the United States. So I decided to look into this a, a little more carefully. Um, and so I started, uh, uh, something that came to my mind was, you know, most scholars today agree that the Gospels are of the genre of Greco-Roman biography. They say, why Greco-Roman rather than Jewish biography? Well, for some reason unknown to us, the Jews of Jesus' day did not write biographies of their sages. We don't know why, they just didn't. So if the gospel authors were going to write biographies of Jesus, Greco-Roman biography was the only game in town. So I thought, well, you know, a lot of scholars today say that Greco-Roman biography had flexibility, allowed flexibility in the way things were reported, but they rarely discuss these flexibilities and how it could result in differences. So I made a list of all the ancient biographies written within, say, 150, 200 years of Jesus, and came up with a list of just shy of 100. And of those, a guy named Plutarch wrote 50 of them. He actually wrote more than 60, but 50 have survived. And much of what we know today about the Greco-Roman world comes from Plutarch. Plutarch wrote at the end of the first century, the beginning of the second century. And um, uh, nine of those 50 biographies, as I finished reading them, um, nine of them I re recognized involved people who lived at the same time, they knew one another, and they participated in many of the same events. In fact, uh, events that have to do with the fall of the Roman Republic. So people like Caesar, Cicero, Pompey, Crassus, uh, Cato the Younger, Brutus, Antony, Sertorius, Lucullus, all of these people uh, would have known one another. Uh, some of them fought against each other. Um, so um, because Plutarch is relying on the same sources and he's the same author writing on the same people multiple times, well, that's going to result, I can go and look at how the same author reports the same events and see if there are any differences in it. This is a unique opportunity for historians. Because you see, when you compare Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you're comparing four different authors. It'd be like taking Suetonius and Tacitus, Josephus and Cassius Dio, and comparing how all four of them report the same event. All right, but you could look at that and say, well, some of them got it wrong, there was lapses of memory and, and, and things like this. But when you look at Plutarch, the same author, reporting on the same people, the same events, and oftentimes using the same sources, if there were differences, well, then we know that there's something else that may be going on here. So um, I've spent the last four years now focusing on Plutarch, six years focusing on differences in the Gospels. And as I've read through the Gospels carefully, I'm 53 years old, I've been a Christian since I was 10 years old, so what ends up happening, for those of us who have been Christians for a while, you know that as you've been reading through the Gospels, it can, you, your mind can kind of stray because you've read them so many times, you know what's coming up next. And so what I've done, you know, in my schooling, I learned Greek, the original language in which the New Testament was written. And so I have read uh, the Gospels exclusively in Greek for the last six years, read through them all multiple times. And as you do this, it really slows you down and causes you to think very carefully about what you're reading. And all of a sudden, differences in the Gospels were just popping up everywhere. And so I started to put them down and record them. And that document in which I put them has grown to more than 50 pages. So as I start reading now through Plutarch, I, I have found 36 or 37, I forgot which, 36 or 37 stories that appear two or more times. Like for example, the assassination of Julius Caesar appears four different times in Plutarch's biographies. They're called lives. Uh, they weren't called biographies uh, until a couple hundred years later, but back in Jesus' day they called them lives. So like the life of Caesar, the life of Cicero. So 36 or 37 of these that appear two or more times, and I'm able to compare them, and I find all these differences, and guess what? The same kind of differences you find in the Gospels. And when the same kind of differences appear over and over, you start to notice patterns. You know, whoa, well, there's these patterns. That suggests that this was intentional on Plutarch's part. It's a compositional device. 
So this morning, I'm only going to identify a few of those compositional devices I've seen. I've, I've, I've seen five. I'm going to identify three of them, give you examples in Plutarch, and then take you right to the Gospels where you can see the Gospel authors doing the same thing. This is groundbreaking, cutting-edge stuff, and none of it's been published yet. Um, I'm shopping publisher for the book. I've got a, a, a very uh, prestigious uh, academic publisher that's very positive about it at the moment. We'll just see if that goes through. I'm hoping it will be on bookshelves around this time two years from now. So um, um, let's just jump into this and see what, um, see what we see. Let me introduce you to some characters. Our first character is Julius Caesar. And Caesar lived from approximately 100 BC to 44 BC. As you know, he was assassinated on the Ides of March, which is March 15th, 44 BC. Caesar was, um, he, was a, he was a politician for sure. Um, he, he was, uh, from a very young age, he had great ambition, great ambition. He really wanted to become the Roman emperor and dictator. And he started that, again, from a very young age. He had some decent people skills. He had a lot of political savviness. He wasn't nearly as brutal as some of the other Roman leaders were. Um, but we'll talk more about Caesar in a moment. But he was uh, the first dictator after Sulla. Sulla died in uh, uh, 78 BC, and then it went to the Republic, and then Caesar was the one that, you know, kind of really started taking that down. Then we have a guy named Pompey. Now, um, Pompeii, some people get this confused. I got it confused for years. Um, Pompeii is the city. Maybe you saw the movie about Pompeii being destroyed by the volcano. So Pompeii is the city. Pompey is the person. Pompey was a famous general. He lived from 106 BC to 48 BC. So he's six years older than Caesar. Um, Caesar and Pompey were nemesis, uh, the nemeses. Uh, they just um, they got along with each other, but they really didn't like each other. Uh, they both wanted to be the number one person, the number one man in Rome. And um, Pompey also was a good politician. Um, he was one of the most popular peop uh, uh, Romans among the people. A great Roman general, perhaps the greatest of the Roman generals. Um, and um, he wasn't as aggressive as Caesar. He could be brutal at times, for sure, but he wasn't as aggressive as Caesar. He was a pretty mild guy by Roman standards. Um, um, he, at one point, he married uh, Caesar's daughter, uh, who was you know, a couple decades younger than him, and, um, but they just loved each other. And once his daughter died, uh, once Pompey's wife died, um, then, uh, you know, the peace that Pompey and Caesar had uh, was destroyed. And they ended up facing each other at Pharsalus in August 48 BC. And although Pompey had more people, although, um, uh, you know, he should have won that battle, Caesar was a little more aggressive. He had some things go his way and he defeated Pompey. Uh, Pompey was killed uh, or killed himself shortly thereafter. And Caesar went on to take Rome. Got a guy named Crassus. Pompey and Crassus were kind of colleagues. Crassus also had great political ambition. Um, Crassus didn't have the people skills. He was a little more brutal. And uh, in fact, he was the guy that defeated Spartacus in the Servile War. Um, I think it was 71 BC. And um, crucified, I think it was 6,000 of Spartacus's uh, followers along the Appian Way. Um, Crassus, again, didn't have the people skills, he didn't have the personality, uh, the charismatic personality that Pompey had, and, uh, but he was really good with money. And he invested and became wealthy. And so you had what was called, um, some have called the first triumvirate, and that was between uh, Caesar, Crassus, and Pompey, and they formed this agreement. Um, most classicist scholars would say that's not the first triumvirate. It was later on with Augustus and uh, Antony and so forth. So, um, but they did form a couple of agreements to work with each other. And Crassus was just a few years older than Pompey, and he died a few years before Pompey did. And he was killed in battle. Actually, he committed suicide when he had lost. 
Uh, one of my favorite Romans, pr probably my favorite Roman, is uh, Cato the Younger, uh, compared to Cato the Elder, who was, I think, his grandfather. I, I forgot. But this guy had unswerving integrity, um, according to the reports. You couldn't bribe him. You couldn't sweet-talk him into anything. He lived by principle and principle alone. Um, he didn't give deference or any favors to his friends. He was there to do what was right, to serve the Roman people. The Romans loved him. He got himself in trouble because he wouldn't play the game of politics like the others. Pompey, or I'm sorry, uh, Cato would be defeated in battle by Julius Caesar, and he would kill himself by his own sword in 46 BC, uh, three years after Caesar had crossed the Rubicon. So those are our main characters, just to give you a little idea what's going on here, all right? Because we're going to use these in some of these stories from Plutarch's lives. So let's jump right into these then and look at some of these compositional devices that Plutarch uses when writing his biographies of these people. The first we're going to call transferal. Transferal is when an author knowingly attributes words or actions to a person that he knew belonged to another. Let's look at an example of this, all right? So it's when an author knowingly attributes words or actions to a person that he knew belonged to another. All right, so um, there we go, Pompey. So uh, in the year 53 BC, Rome is in a state of great chaos. It, it almost collapsed. And so the people knew that they needed to do something drastic. And so um, they uh, voted, the Senate voted, that Pompey would become what's called sole consul. Now, um, I was introduced a little bit politically to how your system works yesterday. They took me through the parliament building. It's really, really cool. I enjoyed that. Um, and so I, I get a little better understanding of how your political system works, you know, somewhat similar to what we have down in the States. And, um, you know, our president, he serves, he or she serves for four years their term, and then they can go for a second term. Um, but they're like the number one person in the land. Well, in the Roman Republic, the number one position, political post in the land was called the consul. And there were two consuls who served together, not one, but two. And they only served for one year. And then you could serve as many terms as you wanted, uh, you got elected for, but you couldn't even run for a second term for another 10 years. And I don't know about you guys up here, but I wish they did that down in the United States. <laughs> um, so, uh, but it was drastic times in Rome, and so they said, hey, let's appoint Pompey as sole consul, give him nearly absolute authority to do what he wants to, you know, really get this country shaped up again. And they called and they thought he, he would be tough. He'd be a, a surgeon that would have to cut out some nasty disease in, within the government and within the country, but he would be the gentlest of physicians, they called him. So one of the first things Pompey did was he introduced a law that said that when a, a defendant was on trial, he could not have friends come in, as was allowed to that day, and read what was called an encomium. And an encomium, it was a, um, a speech that would talk about all the good things that this person has done and said. What a good person they are. Now, of course, the reason that's not really, it's not really relevant to a trial. I mean, it's like, what if my buddy Greg M Manette here was arrested for murder? And let's say he'd really done it. Um, you know, huh? <laughs> yeah, believe me, I don't think you'd ever do that. But let's say he, he really killed someone, all right? That would, I, I couldn't go and give an encomium and say, Greg's this great guy, and wow, he's this great speaker, and he's got this really great knowledge, and I've known him for a while, and he's a really good friend. Well, that's completely irrelevant to whether he murdered the person, right? So Pompey said, you can't do that anymore. You can't read encomiums. So here it is, 50... 52 BC, he makes this law, and then he breaks his own law. Because he's got this guy, a friend named Plancus, who's on trial. And so as we read in the life of Cato, um, what ends up happening when Plancus is on trial, Pompey writes an encomium 
and sent, he's out of town, Pompey's out of town, writes an encomium and he sends an emissary into the trial in Rome of Plancus and the emissary reads Pompey's encomium. Well, Cato is so incensed over this that he, he, he really just, um, well, let me go back. Cato is so incensed over this that he jumps up and he, he so strenuously objects to it that he gets removed from the jury. And, um, but anyway, Plancus gets convicted anyway. So this is in the life of Cato. And the reason he reports this, and you know, because Cato is involved, and, he, and so he's telling all about the story here. And we know that this is the way it occurred because other historians report the same thing. But when we read the same story in the life of Pompey, it's Pompey himself who writes the encomium and reads it himself at the trial. So, did Pompey read it himself or did he remain out of town and send an emissary in to read it? It depends which life of, uh, written by Plutarch you read. So, it seems like a contradiction, right? Well, which one is it? Well, this is called transferal. What ends up happening is when he writes, Plutarch writes the life of Pompey, he kind of abbreviates things. He knows that Pompey wrote the words, and rather than just saying, you know, he sends this emissary in, he just has Pompey read it. He changes it. He alters the details and has Pompey read it because ultimately these words did come from Pompey. This would not, and this happens a lot within Plutarch's lives. It happens a lot within ancient history. So uh, the ancients would have considered this a proper uh, rhetorical device, uh, a way of writing and changing up things within the ancient literature. We may not do that so much today, but they did it back then. Now, let's look at transferal in the Gospels. Um, there are several examples, but let me just, uh, let me give you one real quickly here. Um, this has to do with the healing of the centurion's servant. When we read this in Luke, the centurion has a servant who's very valuable and who is dying. So the centurion sends some uh, friends, some Jewish elders actually, to go see Jesus. And they say, Jesus, this, this centurion's a great guy. He loves our people. He's uh, given money to build our synagogue. Um, he is worthy of your help. Please heal his servant. So Jesus says, okay, let's go. So um, they start to go, and the centurion finds that he's coming to his house. And so the centurion sends out some of his friends, and they say, oh, the centurion says, no, 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 no. Uh, he, the centurion says, I am unworthy for you to come under my roof. So listen, I'm a man of authority, Jesus, just like you. I tell a soldier to do this, he does this. I tell him to come, and he comes. I tell a servant to go, and he goes. So you're a man of authority, just speak the word, and my servant will be healed. Jesus praises the centurion for his faith, and he heals his servant from afar. This is how it's reported in Luke. Now, when we read the same story in Matthew, it's kind of interesting. Um, in Matthew, we read that the centurion himself went to Jesus and said, Jesus, I have the servant and he's dying. Please come and help. And Jesus says, all right, let's go. And the centurion says, no, 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 no. I, I'm a uh, sinful man. I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof. Just because I'm a man of authority just like you, I tell this soldier go and he goes and this one come and he comes and this servant do this and he does it. So just speak the word and my servant will be healed. And Jesus says, he's a man of great faith and he speaks the word and his servant is healed from afar. So the question we say, in Luke, the centurion never even saw Jesus. In Matthew, the centurion himself comes to see Jesus. Do you see the transferal? It's the same thing we see going on in Plutarch. Same thing we see going in Plutarch. This is not a contradiction. This is a compositional device. This is a way that they would write ancient history in order to change things up and uh, make things clearer in some cases. And some way, things, it was just their way of writing. Uh, let me give you one other example. Um, this is when, uh, when you read in the Gospel of Matthew, we read that uh, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, and their mother come to Jesus, and they say, um, uh, the mom speaks up and says, uh, hey, Jesus, I have a favor I want to ask you. And Jesus says, well, what is it? What can I do for you? And she says, hey, when you come into your kingdom, I would like it so that one of my sons sits on your right, 
and one of my sons sits on your left. Throne on your right, throne on your left. I want my sons to be there. And so Jesus looks over at James and John and says, well, let me ask you guys, can you drink the cup that I'm, with, with, I'm going to drink? Yeah. Can you be baptized with the baptism with which I'm about to be baptized? No problem. Okay, guys, well, guess what? You are going to drink the cup that I'm going to drink. You will be baptized with the baptism I'm going to be baptized with. But unfortunately, it's up to my father to decide who's going to sit on my left and right. I told you, Mom, we shouldn't have done this. <laughs> so that's how it goes in Matthew. Now, when we read the same story in Mark, something interesting happens. Mark brushes the mother out of his story. Never even see her. James and John come to Jesus and they say, hey, we have a favor we want to ask. What can I do for you guys? We want to, when you come to your kingdom, we want to sit on your right and your left. And the same thing happens. So uh, Mark transfers the words that the mom had spoke to the lips of James and John. Why? Well, because it was ultimately coming from them, right? So, you know, why uh, put the blame on good old mom there? Let's just give her a break. So that's transferal. Happens a lot in the Gospels. It happens a lot in Plutarch. It happens a lot in ancient history. Let's look at a second compositional device. And this one we'll call spotlighting. Spotlighting is when an author directs focus on his subject to the point that he neglects to mention others who were likewise involved. Well, we're in the little theater here, right? So I'm sure they've got some spotlights in here. And if you've been in here when there was a theatrical play, there's probably been a point when you have some actors, actresses up here, and all of a sudden all the lights go out and a spotlight shows on a single person. Now, you would know that just from seeing the others, they're on stage, but the spotlight is so focused on them you don't see them any longer, but they're there. Well, Plutarch would shine his literary spotlight on his characters at times. And I want to show you how this happens. Um, you had what was called the Catalinarian Conspiracy of 63 BC. There was a guy named Catiline. He wanted to be serve as consul, had political aspirations. And so he uh, tries to become consul and he uh, gets defeated um, by Cicero. And Cicero that year is one of the two consuls. And so he runs again, and he loses again. And, um, but he's this evil guy, and so he has plans that he's going to get this conspiracy, he's going to kill all the Roman senators, and then he's going to burn the city and rebuild as its new leader. So now we're looking at, it's November of 63 BC. So what would that be? 2077 years ago, this month. So can you hear it now? This month, 2077 years ago. <laughs> um, so you have, at this point, uh, Catiline is, is planning this conspiracy. And um, at night, one night, this unnamed anonymous, this un anonymous person shows up at the house of Crassus and gives him a letter that's addressed to Crassus and one that's addressed to a bunch of other senators, uh, uh, to each of the other senators, uh, warning them of Catiline's conspiracy and the violence that's about to occur. So in the life of Cicero, we find uh, Crassus, Metellus, and Marcellus who come at night to the house of Cicero, they wake him up and they say, Cicero, uh, you're the consul. We just had these delivered to us tonight. We got these letters warning us of what Catiline is planning. And so the next day, uh, Cicero takes, calls the Senate together and, um, and gets things rolling in terms of defending the city against Catiline. This is in the life of Cicero. In the life of Crassus, the whole biography of Cra is about Crassus. So what Plutarch does when he tells the same story is he shines his literary spotlight on Crassus. Now we know that Metellus and Marcellus are there, but Plutarch doesn't mention them. This is the life of Crassus, and so Plutarch shines his spotlight on him. So he only mentions Crassus delivering the letters. 
It's not to say that the others weren't there. He just doesn't mention them because he's shining his spotlight on Crassus. That's one example in Plutarch of spotlighting. Let me give you one more. So Cicero calls the Senate, and he says, uh, what should we do? We've got a couple of conspirators here um, that we've caught. Catiline has fled. We've got a couple of conspirators that we've captured. What should we do with them? And so Cicero stands up. I'm, I'm sorry, Caesar gets up. Caesar is not a huge political power at this point. Um, and he stands up and he says, well, I think what we should do is imprison these guys um, and, and um, give them, uh, you know, put them in prison until uh, we capture Catiline and put down his army. And at that point, this is in the life of Caesar and life of Cicero, you have Cato stand up and one of the other uh, senators, they both stand up and they object. In fact, it's the other that gets up first and objects and says, no, uh, these guys need to be put to death. And they persuade Cicero and the Senate to have these guys put to death. That's how it's reported in the life of Caesar and the life of Cicero. But when we read the same story in the life of Cato, well, it's a story about Cato. We don't care about the other senator. And so Plutarch shines his literary spotlight on Cato. And so it's Cato that stands up. He doesn't say only Cato stands up, but that's the picture we get, because he doesn't mention the other. And it's Cato alone that seems to persuade Cicero and the Senate to have the conspirators put to death. So we can see again, Plutarch shining his literary spotlight on his main character. Of the five compositional devices that I've uh, noticed within Plutarch's lives that appear over and over, spotlighting is the most frequent. It occurs more than any of the others. Now, let's go to spotlighting in the Gospels. You might be able to think of a few uh, differences immediately that can be explained via spotlighting. Think of the empty tomb. How many women went to the empty tomb? Well, how many angels were there? Matthew and Mark say one. Luke and John say two. Could it be that Matthew and Mark are spotlighting? They're only mentioning the angel who's speaking the message of the resurrection. It's very possible that that's what's going on. All right, let's look at another, uh, another instance. How many women were there? Well, Matthew, Mark, and Luke report multiple women. Um, and then John says, early in the morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene got up and ran to the tomb and found it empty. So was it, were there multiple women, or was there just Mary Magdalene? Hmm, could spotlighting be going on here? It would appear that it is, because if you look at the next verse, this is John chapter 20, verses 1 and 2. Early in the morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene got up, ran to the tomb, and found it empty. She runs back to the disciples, verse 2, and says, they have taken the Lord, and we don't know where they laid him. Who's we? You say, well, maybe it's Peter, the beloved disciple, and Mary. Well, maybe. But well, maybe it's the other women, too. Say, well, is John the only one who would do that, or something like that? Nope, and I'm glad you asked. Because who ran to the tomb when the women reported that it was empty? When you read Luke, it says Peter got up and ran to the tomb and found it as the women had said. But when you read it in John, it says Peter and the beloved disciple got up and ran to the tomb and found it as Mary had said. But what's really interesting, when Luke reports this, um, he says, uh, it's chapter 24, I think it's verse uh, 12, 11 or 12. And he says, um, Peter got up and ran to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, and then he went home. Twelve verses later, you've got uh, Jesus talking to the Emmaus disciples, and it says, their eyes were kept from recognizing Jesus. And at that point, it says, uh, Jesus is playing with them a little bit. Hey, why the long faces, guys? They don't recognize him. Why the long faces? Are you the only guy in Jerusalem that isn't aware of what's happened these last couple days? No, tell me. That must have been fun. And he said, well, there was this guy named Jesus, this great prophet. And we thought he was the Messiah. And gosh, just this last Friday, you know, they crucified him. 
But our, our women folk went to the tomb this morning. They saw angels and they, who had said he'd been raised. And then some of our own, some of our own, not Peter, some of our own got up and ran to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. Well, wait a minute, Luke, just 12 verses earlier, you said just Peter went to the tomb. Luke said, no, I didn't say just Peter. I only mentioned Peter at that point. He is the lead apostle after all. I only mentioned Peter, but here it is 12 verses later. I'm making it pretty clear that it was more than Peter. Well, Luke, you're spotlighting. We don't do that today. Uh, so? <laughs> So we could see this going on three times in the, that, in the resurrection narratives. How many angels were there? Spotlighting. How many women went to the tomb? Spotlighting. How many people went, ran to the tomb of the disciples after the women reported it was raised? Spotlighting. It's right there. These aren't contradictions. They're differences that are there as a result of the literary devices that these ancient authors use, the same thing as other ancient authors, and we have to judge them according to uh, the rules of their day, not import our ideas of modern precision upon them. All right, let's look at one more. Simplification. Simplification is when an author adapts his material by omitting details that may complicate the literary portrait of the subject he is painting. Now, one of the, the great Romans, uh, probably my second favorite, but a very close second, is Brutus. Now, Brutus, I know he sounds brutal, right, his name. How would you like to be named Brutus? You, know, you think of this big, muscular guy, right? Well, actually, Brutus was known as a thin, pale guy <laughs> with long hair. Really, I mean, that's, that's how they have him. Um, in fact, Caesar, when, when others were suspecting that um, um, uh, Antony was, was uh, forming a conspiracy against um, uh, Caesar, uh, Caesar said, I'm not worried about guys like that, the big, burly, handsome guys. I'm, I'm worried about the, the thin and pale ones like Brutus and, and Cassius. So um, anyway, but Brutus was known as uh, a fair-minded Roman, uh, fair and mild by Roman standards, that would be. Um, in fact, what's really interesting, Brutus, uh, he was so fair that um, when Brutus was nearby and another Roman general like um, uh, Cassius uh, was wanting to take a city, the city said, no, we want to be captured by Brutus because we hear he's real uh, fair with the people that have fought against him. And uh, according to the stories, Brutus came and he took the city and he was merciful to the people and even better to those he had captured than they had expected. Um, uh, Brutus had definitely had some, um, some, some problems though. Um, he had some moral hiccups. At one point he um, divorced his wife just to marry another one. Um, he, on another occasion, he uh, made a loan to the, the city of Cyprus for 48% annual interest, which would cripple the city. And he did it for political reasons, to help his friends. Um, on a, now, what's really interesting is when Brutus, in, when, so let's just go back a few years, and when Pompey uh, is, is defeated by uh, Caesar, he flees to Egypt. And the Egyptians deceive him and say, we'll give you safe passage. And on his way in a boat that they were escorting him into Egypt, they killed him. They killed Pompey. So uh, when Caesar came to Egypt, when he found out the, the inglorious death in which the Egyptians had given Pompey, um, he executed those he could find who were involved in that decision. Well, the guy named Theodotus, who suggested it, he fled and was able to escape. When you read the life of Brutus by Plutarch, you find that Plutarch reports that um, when Brutus was out there, he actually found, he discovered Theodotus, and he punished him for what he did. And that's all it said. But when you read about it in the life of Pompey, since it was Pompey being killed, uh, who had been killed, it says that when uh, they discovered Theodotus, uh, when Brutus discovered him, he put him to death using every sort of torture. 
Now, why doesn't Plutarch report this in his life of Brutus? Because it would complicate the portrait he is painting of his character Brutus, who is a fair and moderate Roman, by Roman standards. Why doesn't Plutarch report the 48% uh, annual interest loan that Brutus made to Cyprus? Because it would complicate the portrait he is painting of his fair and moderate Brutus. Now, was Brutus fair and moderate? Yes. So um, did these things happen? The other, the bad things, yes, they happened. But again, he doesn't include those because he doesn't want people to get confused. And ancient biography should not be confused with modern biography. The modern biographies, the objective is informational. In ancient biography, the objective was instructional. The ancient biographers wanted to paint a portrait of their character, an accurate portrait of their character, so that readers would emulate the good qualities and eschew the bad ones. So um, usually focused on the good or all bad, but a lot of times not mixed. So that's why they're not included. It's a simplification. Do we have this going on in the Gospels? I think we can say there's a good chance there is, especially in the Gospel of John. I want you to think about the garden scene. Now, when you read about the garden scene in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus is really sweating over this. He does not want to go through this. Father, if at all possible, let the, remove this cup from me. He wants out if possible. I mean, who wouldn't want to get out from what Jesus is about to experience? So he, he sweat, deliver me from this hour, if at all possible. Not as I will, but as you will, God, but deliver me if possible. I don't want to go through this. This is what we find with Jesus. But when we read the Gospel of John, we don't find any of this. When you read the Gospel of John, it's, uh, you have Peter lopping off the ear of the high priest's servant, Malchus, and Jesus says, put your sword away, Peter. Should the cup that the Father has given me to drink, shall I not drink it? No, I was born for this very hour. Shall I ask the Father to deliver me from this hour? No, that's why I came into this world. So we find in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus saying, deliver me from this hour, remove this cup from me. Whereas in John, Jesus says, I will not ask the Father to remove this cup. I will not ask the Father to remove me from this hour. He's simplifying. Why? Because some of John's readers may have a little bit of, of confusion thinking, wow, the divine son of God is gonna go through all this torture. He's allowing his own creation to torture and kill him. How can that be? So he simplifies the portrait that he's painting of Jesus by adjusting some of the details. Now, is the end result, is the message the same? You bet it's the same. That's the same. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus says, not as I will, but as you will. And that's exactly what we find in John. But what John has done is brushed out some of the details that could complicate the portrait he is painting of Jesus. So let's kind of wrap this up here. You've got, um, what, what does all this have to do with the reliability of the Gospels? I think we have to consider genre here. What happens when you find out that, uh, when you read Jesus' parables and you find out the, the parable of the Good Samaritan, that the Good Samaritan was not a historical figure? Or the parable of the prodigal son? What would you do if you found out the prodigal son never existed? Well, of course he never existed. It's a parable. You don't have any problems with that. Or what about in the Psalms, when the psalmist says of God, awake, you who sleep. Does God ever sleep? Oh, well, what's this? This is poetic, metaphorical language that's given by the psalmist. You say, but that's psalms. Or what about when you read in Proverbs and it says, wisdom standeth at her rooftop shouting, let all the simple come to me. Do we really think that there's this woman named Wisdom who stands on the rooftop and yells that out to people as they're passing by? Well, no, you say, that's because that's a proverb. That's wisdom literature. The Gospels are biographies. That's right. And guess what? Ancient biography allowed the kind of stuff that I'm talking about. We see Plutarch doing it. So this shouldn't be problematic to us. What it involves is us having to recalibrate our thinking about the Gospels. 
It's not to say they're not history. of Yes, they're history. But the authors could change things a little bit in order to make their, um, they could transfer what one person said to another. They could compress stories. They could shine a spotlight. They could uh, conflate stories or take two stories and combine them together. They could do all kinds of things like this and they could simplify. That's all part of writing ancient biography. Does the message change? This doesn't change the ultimate message a bit. But this is what you could do with ancient history. You know, even today, amateur photography is a hobby of mine. And, you know, today a photographer could see a couple walking through the meadow holding hands on a sunny day, and it's kind of romantic, right? And they could take a picture of this and take it back and put it in Photoshop and cast a little bit of a haze over the, uh, over the meadow uh, to give it more of a nostalgic, romantic uh, feel to it. Um, we don't object when, it, when a photographer does something like that in order to emphasize the romantic element of that moment. Now, we would object if the photographer made the skies all dark, like with thunderstorm clouds and put lightning in the background, because that would be distorting the picture um, to, to communicate a message that was opposite of what it was really like. But we don't mind when an artist does something like this because it doesn't really change anything, it just emphasizes certain things uh, which were actually there, which you may not catch as clearly without this adjustment. Well, the gospel authors would do the same things, and not just the gospel authors, but all ancient authors would do these kinds of things. Sometimes just because this is the way you wrote ancient history and biography. Sometimes because they wanted to emphasize a particular element of their narrative or um, uh, a particular kind of um, uh, uh, element within the person's character. In the case of Jesus, maybe his divinity and things like this. So uh, I think the problem that we have sometimes, that I had for several years and before embarking on the study, is um, it, it's kind of like... Uh, we look at ancient texts through a lens that is adjusted to view them through modern eyes. But when we adjust our lens to view the ancient text using um, their rules, a lot more is going to come into focus. So um, that's that. And um, there's my website. I've got a, um, other lectures on there about the Gospels and differences and things like that. I've got a number of my debates that I've had with atheists and agnostics and Muslims that you can watch on there as, as well. So let's, uh, I'm also on Facebook and Twitter. If you go to Facebook, I've already got my 5,000 friends. So you have to go to uh, the uh, Michael Lacona uh, public figure page. I've got like 1,800 and some likes. So you can go there and we can communicate that way. And at Twitter, I'm at, at Michael Lacona, if you want to follow. Thank you, Dr. Lacona. Very good. Let's get right into the questions. Uh, there's quite a few here lined up. First question, how are we to know when these devices are being used? Well, um, I think, you know, we can't, unfortunately, we can't get into a time machine and return to the past to ask the authors, right? That would be really nice if we could do that. But when we see things that are common within uh, ancient authors, like transferal, like spotlighting, like simplification, and then we see that this can easily account for these things. I don't, uh, listen, I'm not for straining uh, the Gospels in order to try to make them fit these kind of things, like a strained harmonization, you know, like a hermeneutical waterboarding until the texts tell you what you want to hear. Um, <laughs> I'm not for that. But when you see these literary devices that are common amongst ancient authors, and then you, you see that these can easily explain numerous. Uh, look, I said I got over 50 pages of differences that I've cataloged in my work uh, in the Gospels. I I'm telling you, in the high 90 percentile, these things can account for it. So uh, when you see these kinds of differences, and they're easily explained by the same kind of things that we see other ancient historians doing in abundance. There's no reason to think that this is anything different. We'd have to be saying that the Gospels are so unique that they avoided all the literary devices of their day. Why would we do that? Thank you. Next question. 
Um, how linguistically sophisticated are the New Testament writings compared to other works of the time? I mean, certainly you mentioned Plutarch. Yeah. But, uh, um, well, boy, I'd like to punt that one to, uh, to Craig Evans, really. Okay. Yeah, he'd, he'd be really good for something like that. Or, or Dan Wallace, because he, he also knows the Greek. They both know the Greek. I mean, I've been studying Greek since uh, 1982, but they've been studying it longer and a lot more thoroughly than me. Um, but I, Luke is, is certainly, a, you know, pretty I, I really like, in terms of the writers, though, Wow, Matthew and John, I think, are our most sophisticated gospel authors in the way that they put things together. More sophisticated than Mark, who's kind of awkward at times. Um, and Luke, even though uh, we would look at him as the, the most educated and his Greek is probably um, the, the most difficult for us to read, maybe the most advanced kind of Greek he's using, I, I don't think he was as good a writer, author, as Matthew and John. So um, uh, Plutarch is a very good writer. In fact, you can read him in English. He really is one of the best reads in English. He's, he's, he's really a, a talented author. Thank you. Okay, here's another question. And uh, this bubbled around last night as well. But do you think the term inerrant is unhelpful? Do I think the term inerrant is unhelpful? Boy, someone wants to get me in trouble here. Um, <laughs> I'll just move over here. Yeah. Well, let me... <laughs> um, John Walton, who teaches at Wheaton uh, College, and uh, Brett Sandy, who teaches New Testament there, uh, John Walton teaches Old Testament, you've got to uh, subscribe to the doctrine of biblical inerrancy in order to teach at Wheaton. They wrote a book that was published last year called The Lost World of Scripture, and in there they say when you look at the oral culture and all these things, and I would add when you look at the compositional devices I've talked about, we've come to a time when inerrancy may not be the best way to describe our view of the Bible. Maybe it's infallible, certainly divinely inspired. Maybe it's infallible. I mean, what, what, do, you, what do you call an error? It, that becomes the complicating question. Um, for example, when you, you've got, did the centurion go to see Jesus himself, or did he send those emissaries to request him to heal his servant? Is that an error? Well, I'd say no, that's a compositional device. So, what do you consider an error? Some would say, well, no. If it said the centurion went and he really never saw it, that is an error. Well, if you want to be that strict, well, then I guess you got an error. But, I mean, that's just, I think that's being unreasonable. Um, and then the, the problem is we really don't know how God divinely inspired the scriptures. I mean, it doesn't say that he dictated it word for word to the people. Most people don't believe that, that he did. It's not like a Quranic view of, of inspiration there where, you know, Muhammad receives these revelations and puts them down word for word. We don't know how God inspired it. So did he inspire it word for word? Or did he inspire the teachings? Did he inspire the concepts and make sure he got all of those correct? Did God guide the authors in such a way to make sure everything was there that was necessary for us? And if they got a couple of minor details wrong, um, you know, what's the deal with that? Did, maybe God didn't mind. I, I don't know. I don't think any of us could know. So it could be that the term inerrancy really is just not the right term for us any longer. Um, I think we can say that the Bible is divinely inspired. It is authoritative, absolutely authoritative in the life of the believer is the way it tells us how we should live our lives. Um, I just don't know that inerrancy is the best term anymore. Okay, we have time for a few more questions. Yeah. You're doing well. Um, <laughs> can you comment on the Q source? that some scholars think existed as a source for the Gospels. Can the different sources for the Gospel authors also explain the differences in addition to the literary tools that you mentioned? Yeah, well, I do think that the different Gospel sources can uh, provide differences or reasons to explain. It. There are a number of reasons uh, that we've got differences in the Gospels. The different sources, uh, Q, let me mention that real quick. Q um, is, you, you've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and these Gospels are called the Synoptic Gospels because they can be viewed with one another uh, side by side, and they're so very similar. When you look at John, it's like, whoa, what's going on here? He's so different. Um, he reports different stories. He reports them. Uh, Jesus sounds a little differently in John, quite differently. His, his message is the same, but uh, John does a lot of paraphrasing 
of Jesus' words. And when you read the Greek in 1 John and then you read Jesus' sayings in the Gospel of John, sometimes you find they're like the same. So it's kind of like, all right, John is mimicking the way Jesus spoke, or he's taking Jesus' words and rewording them the way he would say them, You're paraphrasing them. I think it's the latter. Um, or else you'd have to say Matthew, Mark, and Luke paraphrased, and John had it exactly how Jesus said it. So um, anyway, when you look at Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you see that there's this literary relationship between them, and scholars try to figure out what is that relationship, and we don't know for certain. But most scholars today think that Mark was written first, and that Matthew and Luke used Mark as one of their sources. Makes sense. If church tradition is correct, Peter was Mark's source, the lead apostle. So why wouldn't you want to use that, especially when Peter was at places that the other apostles weren't, like the transfiguration, like the, in the garden close to Jesus when he takes them. You know, he, they're, they're going to have some things that Matthew and Luke weren't privy to. So why not look at Mark because he's using Petrine uh, tradition. So you, you've got that. So when you've got all three Gospels that have similar stories, almost word for word, they say that Mark is the source. But what happens when you've got a tradition that is almost word for word in, in Matthew and Luke, and it's absent from Mark? Well, that means that either Luke used Matthew as a source, or Matthew used Luke as a source, or both of them had a common source. And most scholars today, not all, there's a growing number of scholars who would disagree with this, but most New Testament scholars today, whether they're conservative, evangelical, or liberal, moderate, doesn't matter, they think that Matthew and Luke had a common source from which they drew, and they just call that Q. It's like X. But it comes from the German word, uh, starting with Q, means quella, which is the German word for source. So that's all it is. We've never found any manuscripts of Q. We don't know if it was an oral source or a written source. For all we know, it could have been notes that the apostles carried around with each other when telling these stories about Jesus. It could have been that. It could have been oral tradition that was memorized word for word. We really don't know. And it may be that Q never existed and that Matthew used Luke or Luke used Matthew. We just don't know. So, but if Q existed, and I have no problems believing it did, but if Q existed, then we've got an earlier source than the Gospels on Jesus, which is pretty cool, actually, from the viewpoint of a historian. And Luke, in the first three verses of his Gospel, said many others had compiled um, accounts of Jesus. And so he was going to compile another one in an orderly manner. So that's Q. So yeah, different sources could cause it. Uh, theological redaction can cause it. Uh, um, these literary devices I mentioned, and then there's what are called progenosmatas, which are uh, preliminary exercises for rhetoricians in how to write literature. Theon was one who wrote in the first century, and he talks about all these kinds of things, and that can result in differences. Okay, excellent. I think we're going to need a glossary for uh, some of the terms that are being used. Um, this is related to the simplification compositional device that you talked about, this question here. question is, could it be argued that the portrait the gospel writers painted was simplified, idealized, so as not to complicate this biography, painting Jesus as the gentle, fair shepherd and leaving out words and experiences that would have contradicted, complicated his portrait as a loving, perfect, godly messiah? Comp oh, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, in fact, I was having this discussion yesterday with uh, Greg and Craig Evans, and it's like, you know, I, I admit it. I said, you know, I really want to think about Jesus as this um, loving guy who can be my best friend. And like in the shack, that book, you know, you're laying on the pier next to Jesus, looking up at the stars and talking and laughing. I mean, I love that kind of Jesus. Um, and I said, uh, that's the kind of Jesus I want to think about, but I don't really see that Jesus in the New Testament. I see him some in John, but I don't see him real clearly. And uh, but yeah, John seems to be painting a, a portrait of Jesus that is a little bit closer to that than we find in the synoptics. And I, I think John, I, I'm not saying that John's making this up. I think that that's the way Jesus would have been. Maybe it's somewhere between the, what Craig Evans called the Sunday school Jesus and, um, and the real Jesus, uh, the way he, he is. I mean, Jesus is someone to be feared and respected and, and obeyed. It's like C.S. Lewis said in the Chronicles of Narnia at, at the very end of The Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe when Aslan is walking away, and I forgot who it was, but uh, he said, uh, well, it, you know, is, is he, he safe? And, and the beaver said, oh, no, Aslan is not safe, but he's good. Um, and um, so, yeah, I want to have an accurate view of Jesus, but yeah, John paints a, just a little bit different of a portrait 
so as not to complicate that and not have this Jesus who gets really mad at times. And All right, thank you, Dr. Lacona.